The first three Gran Turismo games hold a special place in my heart. They kickstarted a teenage phase in which I was obsessed with sports cars. Gran Turismo 2 even introduced me to my favorite contemporary rock band, the Foo Fighters. I played the shit out of all three of those games, and Gran Turismo 3 still ranks among one of my favorite games ever. And having gone back to play all of these games in order to collect footage for this video, I'm actually pleased to say that I feel like they've all held up really well over the decades. 25 years later, Gran Turismo 1 is still a good game, if you have a console to run it on. But around the time of Gran Turismo 4, my once beloved car racing franchise and I had started going in different directions. My enthusiasm for cars and racing had waned, and some subtle and not so subtle shifts in how Gran Turismo 4 presented its particular enthusiasm for cars and car history just did not work for me. I pre-ordered Gran Turismo 5 on the PS3 back in the days when I still pre-ordered games and back when pre-ordering wasn't a complete scam. It suffered many delays, but when it finally showed up at my door unexpectedly, I barely played it before moving on to other more interesting games. Games like Demon Souls and Dark Souls now monopolized most of my attention and still do 10 years later. Apparently, there was a sixth Gran Turismo game too, but it came and went without me ever knowing that it existed. My interest in the franchise had fallen so low. But I was able to get my hands on a fancy new PlayStation 5 over the holidays, and was looking for technical showcases to see what the fancy new hardware could do. I was especially curious how a simulation racing game would feel on the DualSense controllers thanks to its variety of haptic feedback features. I could definitely see the potential to be able to feel the car and the road underneath the tires through the controller. So I bought Gran Turismo 7, and was promptly reminded of why I fell out of love with this series to begin with. Now don't get me wrong, Gran Turismo 7 plays great. The racing is absolutely fantastic, and I was particularly impressed with how well steering with the controller's motion sensors actually maps to holding a steering wheel. Like, I tried it out thinking that it would just be a novelty, and it would feel awful, and I would stop doing it after a few races, but damn if I haven't been using that uh, input method for my entire playtime with the game. Gran Turismo 7 also does some pretty neat stuff with the DualSense's haptic feedback and adaptive triggers, but this isn't a full review of the game. If you want a full review of the game, you can check out the written review on my personal blog at www.megabearsfan.net. My problem with Gran Turismo 7 is mostly the same problem that I had with Gran Turismo 4. I feel like it's basically the Pokemon of car games more about collecting the cars and posing them for photographs than about actually driving or racing them. The Gran Turismo games have always given away prize cars as rewards for winning race events. However, each successive game seems to give more and more cars away with less and less effort being expected from the player. The first game focused almost exclusively on race series, in which a set of cars would race in multiple sequential races, scoring points from their finished positions in each race, and then adding them all up at the end. The car with the most points after all the races wins the event championship, and if the player is the winner, you get a prize car. This meant that earning a prize car required much more investment and skill from the player. My little used Civic or Corolla likely wasn't going to come in first place in any race, let alone an entire series of races. I'd scratch and claw my way up the leaderboards of events, struggling to get third or fourth place. The small amount of money that I would earn would go towards upgrade parts for my mom mobile, and I would spend time tuning its specs to get the most acceleration or the best top speed or improved handling depending on the specific course. I would try multiple event series with that car, earning small amounts of money from each. Eventually, that mom mobile would be coming in first place in the beginner races. I'd get a prize car, but it would probably suck, so I'd sell it towards more upgrades or towards retiring the mom mobile in favor of a car that I actually wanted. Once I have that car, it would become my main. All my money would go towards upgrading that car, and I would put time and attention towards tuning its specs to get the best possible performance out of it that I could. Some may call this grinding, and they might be right. 
but it's not the same kind of grinding that games make us do today. You know, the kind of excessive grinding that video game executives want us to pay extra money to skip. No, this was just enough of a grind to create a sense of accomplishment. When a prize car came, it felt earned, even though most of them were, like I said, garbage that I would sell anyway. But the time and money invested into each car that I would use created a genuine sense of ownership over those cars. The overall smaller garage also made each car that I owned feel more valuable. The first Gran Turismo was not a big game. It had less than a dozen tracks, only three licenses, and only about 20 events total. So even though I would use my starter car for a decent chunk of the game, that decent chunk still only represents a handful of event series. So only a handful of cars were needed in order to get through the entire campaign. But each of those cars was handpicked and upgraded by me. They were the cars that I wanted. They were my cars. Starting with Gran Turismo 2 and moving forward into the rest of the franchise, there has been an increased focus on single race events, with prize cars being awarded for winning a single race. Less and less attention is paid towards upgrading or tuning a handful of main cars because I'll just earn a better car from the next race event anyway. By the time of Gran Turismo 4, prize cars were being given away like candy. Every race I win awards me with a free car. Further, Gran Turismo 4 added the B-Spec mode, in which I don't even have to drive my car. I just let an AI driver drive it for me, while I tell that AI driver to either drive fast or drive faster. It also added the ability to pose my car for photos in front of scenic locales. The game felt like it had become more about owning and showing off the cars than about ever actually driving them. Though, to be fair to Gran Turismo 4, there is a valid reason for why the B-Spec AI mode is in the game. It is actually a very clever solution to making endurance races a lot more playable and accessible. And if you've watched this channel for a while, you know that I'm always supportive of features that improve accessibility and allow a game to be played and enjoyed by as many people as possible. Not everyone has the time or the willpower to sit and manually race a virtual car for two or three hours straight, let alone for a 24 hour long race, especially if that race is not particularly competitive. It's just boring. Letting an AI drive the car is a good way of allowing these races to be in the game, while still being playable in a reasonable amount of time and without having to bore the player to death for the entire duration. And the endurance races being in the game also allows tire wear, fuel, and oil to become more relevant gameplay mechanics that actually impact the outcome of races. Honestly, I'd be a lot more appreciative of such a feature if it had been released now, when I have a full-time job, kids, and so on all competing for my time, and less time to devote to lengthy endurance races. But the bottom line is that by Gran Turismo 4, I was starting to become subconsciously aware of the growing disconnect between me, the racer, and the virtual cars in my garage. They're feeling less and less like my cars. Now, before I proceed to discuss how Gran Turismo 7 compares, I want to remind my viewers that you can support the creation of this content by becoming a patron. I prefer to be independently funded so that I can keep this content ad-free. Otherwise, this time would be filled with some annoying ad for some stupid pin-pulling mobile puzzle game or pubic hair trimmer or some other nonsense. Not only does the support of viewers like you help keep this content ad-free, Patrons at relevant tiers also receive exclusive previews of upcoming projects, early access to select content, and the opportunity to vote on polls that help guide my future projects. I may add other benefits as my support base grows. In fact, I have a large two-part project about the NCAA football video games that I'm working on in anticipation of EA's upcoming EA Sports college football game. The first part is over half an hour long and is already available early to my patrons. I'll be releasing it to the public when part two is ready, and then part two will be available exclusively to patrons for probably a week or two. You can also support this channel by liking, commenting, subscribing, and sharing this content on your social media platform of choice. 
I give my sincere thanks to all of my patrons and everybody who has helped this channel grow. May you all live long and prosper. Now, about Gran Turismo 7. Not only does Gran Turismo 7 continue the trend from GT4, it actually manages to get worse in some ways. In Gran Turismo 7, I don't even have to win the races anymore. Coming in third place is good enough to be awarded with the prize car. Now, I'm not one to whine about participation trophies. There's merit to rewarding children for effort and boosting their self-esteem. But I'm not six years old. I mean, I am a grown-ass man in my mid-30s who's still playing video games and then complaining about them on the internet, so... <sighs> so who am I to talk about the game's design being too childish? But this design completely wrecks the in-game economy. Credits have little value when I never have to spend them to buy new cars because I'm being given new cars left and right. I don't have to buy new cars, not even for the specialized races that require specific types of cars, because in almost every case I was given an eligible car as a reward for the previous race. In fact, even the game's campaign objectives are more about collecting the cars than about actually driving them. The vast majority of menu books simply require acquiring three themed cars, which can be won by placing third or better in the very same races that the previous uh, menu book unlocked. Once collected, I'm expected to sit through a history lesson about the cars. I'm rarely, if ever, expected to actually race them, let alone win a race with them. And the low payout of the races sure as heck doesn't give me much external motivation to race these cars. Maybe one of the prize cars in the menu book objective will actually be useful in later races, the others just sit in my garage collecting virtual dust. I don't even feel like I have to bother tuning most of my cars, because if a particular car is underpowered for a particular event, I can just use another car from my garage, or win a more powerful car from yet another event, and then use that car on the event that was giving me trouble before. Even if I do decide that I want to upgrade a particular car, the fact that I'm never buying my own cars means that I have hundreds of thousands of dollars in my virtual wallet, and I can always just buy the best, most expensive parts with hardly a second thought. Put simply, there's hardly any difficulty curve or escalation of challenge in Gran Turismo 7's campaign. At least not in the first half of the campaign. The events in the back half of the menu book campaign do get tougher as the recommended performance points goes up above 6 or 700, and upgrades do start to become more necessary. But at this point, I had been long since soured on this campaign, and I barely felt compelled to keep playing into the second half. I only did because, as I said before, the actual driving is just so damn good. Gran Turismo 7 is so excited to give the player all of these free cars and say, look how cool all these cars are, and look how cool you are for having them. And then it gives a history lesson about them, and asks the player to pose them for pictures in front of scenic landscapes. And, oh, I guess you can race them too, you know, if you want. Most of these cars will go completely undriven. Within just a few hours of playing, I had a couple dozen cars, only one of which I had actually bought, and over 200,000 credits. Heck, the launch version of Gran Turismo 7 wouldn't even let players sell unwanted cars. I could discard a card from my garage, but only if it's a duplicate of a model that I already own, and even then, I don't get any money or compensation for it. It just goes to show how little value the in-game money had when the game first launched. Even with the cars that I do drive, there's no real sense of ownership or attachment to the cars. I can customize them, I can tune them, I can paint them and put pretty decals on them and give them fancy new fenders, but none of them ever really feels like my car, not the way they did in the first game. They get driven for a few races, maybe, and then get retired to the garage as new, higher performance cars are handed to me as participation trophies. But hey, to its credit, at least Gran Turismo 7 actually does require me to drive the cars occasionally. It's not like Gran Turismo 4, where I could just let the AI do it for me. 
And it isn't just the emphasis on collecting cars rather than actually racing them that has me miffed about Gran Turismo 7's campaign. The newest game also completely eschews several features of the sport of racing itself. Features that were in previous games going all the way back to the first one on the PlayStation 1. Gran Turismo 7 does not allow the player to run qualifying laps in order to determine pole position in any races. As such, the challenge of completing most events does not come from competing against the cars at the front of the pack. The challenge comes from just trying to get past the cars in the back of the pack within the two or three laps that a race lasts. It's not a test of how well I can race against other evenly matched cars, it's a test of how quickly I can blow past the other 10 or 18 crappy cars just to catch up to the first place car. This just encourages using overpowered cars whenever I want to go for first place, which is not a fun way to play the game. Qualifying laps used to be in Gran Turismo. In fact, the first game even paid out prize money for placing first in pole position. You know, back when money actually had value in the game. Heck, Gran Turismo 7 doesn't even allow the player to run practice laps around a track prior to a race. In fact, I can't find any way to run practice laps or to do a machine test of any kind anywhere in Gran Turismo 7. This puts a chilling effect on wanting to tune a car, since I can't test how the tuning alterations will affect the car's performance prior to actually putting it in a race. Qualifying laps and test laps are a part of the sport of auto racing. I don't understand how something that calls itself the real driving simulator can remove qualifying laps, practice laps, and performance tests and still call itself a simulation racing game. And now we get to the big elephant in the room, the microtransactions and the Haggerty collection. Even though I've spent most of this video so far complaining about how Gran Turismo 7 gives away so many free cars that I never feel like I need to invest in buying one for myself, it is ironic that the game features a set of ultra-rare cars that rotate in and out of stock and which are so expensive as to be completely inaccessible to the vast majority of players. Yes, I can easily earn a couple hundred thousand dollars and be able to afford any stock car in any of the dealerships. But these rare Haggerty collection cars can cost up to 20 million credits. That would take dozens of hours of grinding to be able to afford a single car. Even the microtransactions aren't particularly helpful here, since the largest sum a player can buy is 2 million credits, and that costs 20 US dollars. If I want one of these ultra-rare 20 million credit cars, I would have to buy 10 microtransactions, if you could even call these microtransactions anymore, for a whopping total of $200 of real money for a single virtual car. Without any way to test drive the cars before buying them, there's also no way for a player like me to know if one of these supercars will be suitable to my particular playstyle and if it's even worth buying. I made the mistake of buying this De Tommaso Mangusta for a quarter million credits, by far the cheapest car available in this collection, just to see how it performs. I found it almost impossible to drive, as it would fishtail any time I hit the accelerator or brake. I couldn't return the car for a refund or even sell it at a fraction of its purchase cost. I was just stuck with it, just as I was stuck with my buyer's remorse. The developers have said that they want the rarity of these cars in the game to reflect their real-world rarity, and that their in-game costs also reflect their real-world value. Not only do players have to hope that the car they want is currently in stock, but they have to spend dozens of hours grinding or put up hundreds of dollars of real money to be able to buy the car they want when it does show up. The end result is that my garage is full of a bunch of stock cars that I don't care about, but these rare cars that I might actually want still are not accessible to me. I would love to be able to drive one of these 63 Corvettes or a Shelby Cobra or a Ferrari F50, but even if one shows up in this shop, I'm not going to be able to afford it. Even in an escapist fantasy racing game that's all about collecting exotic cars, players like me still can't afford to buy our exotic dream cars. That's really not the kind of simulation that I was hoping for. 
look, I get that the designers at Polyphony, or Polyphony, whatever the heck it's called, want their game to be as much a digital museum as it is a racing game. These people love cars, and they want to share the history and beauty of these machines that they are so passionate about. I mean, the intro cinematic for Gran Turismo 7 intersperses footage of early cars and racing between clips of Albert Einstein and the Wright brothers flying their plane. As if a Ford Mustang is a work of art that parallels or rivals any piece of music written by the Beatles. Or that it's a scientific and engineering wonder on par with the moon landing. Polyphony wants players to see these cars with the same sense of childlike awe and wonder that they see them. And that's fine. That's great. Go for it. But if you want players to actually see that entire digital museum, then you kind of have to give them a compelling racing game that's going to keep them interested enough throughout the campaign. I kind of feel like there are two different directions that a Gran Turismo game could go. Right now, Polyphony is trying to do a little bit of both, and I feel like that means that they aren't doing either particularly well. The first paradigm is to keep doing what the original game did. Simulate a racing career. The player buys a relatively cheap and low-performing starter car, wins races to earn money, buys upgrades in new cars, and slowly works their way up to higher level events with better cars. Prize cars should be few and far between and should be limited to rare cars that can't be bought from the dealerships. You know, things like the Ford GT40 or Shelby Cobra. This way, almost every car is a car that the player explicitly bought because it's a car that the player wants. Everything feels earned, cash has value, and nothing feels like it's being given away for free. The other paradigm, which Gran Turismo has been slowly shifting towards, is the museum approach. A campaign that acts as a guided tour through the history of cars and racing. In this model, I feel like Polyphony would be better served to just ditch the garage and cash re reward mechanic entirely. Instead, just create a ladder of races in which the player picks from a list of qualifying cars for each event. Maybe you're given a quantity of points for each race, which you can spend towards upgrading or tuning your choice of car. Kind of like the squad building points of a tabletop game like the X-Wings miniature game. Winning races should unlock new events higher in the ladder, which gives the player access to new cars. This creates a steady sense of progress, in which Polyphony has much finer control over which cars the player is driving at any time during the campaign, and Polyphony can spend as much time with any particular type, or make, or generation of car as they wish, and ensure that the player learns how to drive those cars and hopefully comes to appreciate them as a piece of automotive history. I feel like committing to one of these design approaches or the other would lead to a more cohesive and hopefully more engaging campaign, either the player-driven racing campaign of the original Gran Turismo or the more guided, curated museum tour that Polyphony seems to actually want to make. Do one or the other, and do that well. Don't keep trying to do a little bit of both, such that each design actively gets in the way of the other. All of these complaints are based on the launch version of Gran Turismo 7, before a broken update patch took the game offline for a full day, only to go back online with more microtransactions and a grindier campaign. It's just another example of the sleazy corporate greed that has made its way into mainstream video gaming. They release the game without all the grind and microtransactions so that the ESRB review publications and influencers with early review code can't play that stuff and thus cannot warn consumers about it. Then they patch the stuff in weeks later after the game box is stamped with an ESRB rating that says nothing about abusive in-app microtransactions, and reviews have made no mention of it at all. It's a bait-and-switch, and we should call it out every time it happens. But grind-fueled microtransaction economy or no, I'm not sure that Gran Turismo 7 was ever a great racing game to begin with. No matter how much I may enjoy the actual driving in the game, because once again the actual driving is really good, Gran Turismo 7's lackluster campaign and completely borked progression only serves to remind me of why I fell out of love with this series to begin with. Thanks for watching.